Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome. We're glad that uh, everybody braved the Arctic winds to be with us tonight. We certainly appreciate it. Uh, my name is Paul O'Neill, and on behalf of Kingston's Buried Treasures, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's presentation, our monthly lecture series. And I'm very, very excited about tonight's presentation, not only because of the subject, but because of the presenter we have uh, for you tonight. Um, I think it. it you're going to be you're going to be very very happy with with tonight's presentation. I know uh, tonight's presentation actually uh, features John Jay, and we're going to be discussing John Jay's role as one of America's premier diplomats, and that is a critical role that he played that is too often overlooked when we think about Jay, especially here. We think about his role in the Constitutional, the New York State Constitutional Convention. We think of his role as the chief, first Chief Justice of the New York State Supreme Court, and then going on to being the first Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. But it really is the role that he played as a diplomat that was so important in the early foundation of our, of our nation. And when we think about the individuals who've spent periods of time, significant periods of time in Kingston, John Jay is without question the most important. Our local feelings for George Clinton notwithstanding, I mean, as important as George Clinton was, his role in the foundation of our nation doesn't compare at all to that of John Jay. Uh, and as I said, I'm just as excited about our presenter tonight as the subject. Many of you may know Professor Ray Raymond, uh, from his lecture series at SUNY Ulster. He runs the Constitutional uh, Studies Lecture Series. The lectures are wonderful. The, uh, and as fascinating as the subjects are, I have to tell you, I enjoy just as much Professor Raymond's introduction as I do the actual lectures. Uh, his enthusiasm is, I don't want to say contagious this time of year, <laughs> but his enthusiasm and his, and his love of American history and of our Constitution is, is exceptional, and, and it's hard not to be affected by it. Um, Professor Raymond is the director of the Institute for Constitutional Studies at SUNY Ulster. And as impressive as that title is, that really is just a blip on his resume. Uh, he was educated at the University College of Dublin, the University of Kansas, and at Yale University. Uh, and he spent a career as a diplomat in the British Foreign Office. He focused on American politics and government. And I think it's his career as a, as a diplomat that really gives him an insight into John Jay's role that, that is, is often overlooked by others. And I think we're really going to be able to to see this in a much better way because of the incredible experience that, uh, that Ray had as a diplomat. He lectures at West Point. He lectures at the Air Force Academy and uh, um, many places in between. And I have to say, he's one of the nicest people you'll ever meet. Uh, and, and that, and for all these impressive achievements, that, that has to be one of the top. He really is a wonderful person. He's a foremost authority on John Jay, and he's actually in the process of writing a book on John Jay. The working title for it is going to be John Jay Founding Diplomat, so pay attention for when that comes out. And it is a great honor and a privilege to be able to introduce tonight's featured presenter, Professor Ray Raymond. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much indeed. Paul, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. First of all, let me say it's a tremendous privilege to stand at the birthplace of American constitutionalism, because it was here that New York State's constitution, first constitution was written by John Jay, along with Governor Morris, the rake who wrote the constitution. And indeed, together, they not only wrote America's first constitution, but they wrote, in a sense, a model for America's federal constitution. It's a great privilege to be here. Now, can I first of all, Paul, thank you for that lovely introduction. And I have to reply in the immortal words of Mark Twain, um, when someone was kind enough to introduce him in similarly generous terms. And he said, and I quote, you deserve to go to heaven for your generosity. <laughs> wait for it, wait for it. And to the other place for your exaggeration. <laughs> A fuller and more accurate uh, version of my nefarious past can be found on the FBI's most wanted list. <laughs> Since the Navy SEALs took down bin Laden, I've been, they've, I've moved up the list. It's a bit easier to find, you know, 
but easier to find. You can also find me on the Department of Homeland Security's most wanted list as well, so there we go, or persons of interest, etc. Now, you have demonstrated a delightful disregard for prudence in inviting me to speak to you this evening, because, as Paul just uh, mentioned to you, I am a former British diplomat, a member of Her Majesty's Diplomatic Service, which means that I used to be 006. <laughs> Licensed to bore you all to tears. Now, as for my more famous uh, colleague, 007, I will simply say that uh, he drank the martinis. I got the job done. <laughs> now, you've also demonstrated, of course, a delightful disregard for history, uh, because I am very, very acutely aware that about 230 or so years ago, Britain's relations with Kingston, shall we say, went through a slightly uh, <coughs> <coughs> sticky patch because of a misunderstanding over taxes and the small matter of the burning down of Kingston. Sorry about that. <laughs> you know, the lads got a bit out of control. What can I say? For the record, of course, I should say that um, uh, His Majesty's government had raised taxes in order to balance the budget and to provide a government guaranteed social security and Medicare account for every individual colonist. Now, I don't know about you, but I mean, thinking about all this back in the 1760s, I thought they, these proposals were both imaginative and prescient, indeed. But as you know, sadly, they did not meet with the approval of the colonists. And the rest, well, as they say, is history. Now, all of this said, and all this light-hearted humor aside, you are very safe with me. Because although I cannot claim to be a son of the revolution, and uh, ladies in the room, I certainly can't claim to be a daughter of the revolution, I will claim to be a cousin of the revolution, and that I am. Because my forebears, West Country English Puritans, were staunch supporters of the American cause, as were so many other English, Welsh, Scottish, and Irish Protestants. Along with the business community of the great port cities of London and Bristol and Liverpool, it was us who opposed the king, and it was us who supported our American kith and kin. And that brings me to my personal connection to John Jay, the Hudson Valley's, as Paul quite rightly alluded, great founding father, and the subject of my remarks this evening. He and I share a common Huguenot heritage. Over 400 years ago, I keep telling my son William, who very kindly drove me here tonight because I'm still recovering from a broken arm, and I still can't drive safely yet. Not that I ever drove safely in the first place, but there you are. Um, but over 400 years ago, my forebears, William, our family's forebears, like the Jays, were successful bankers in La Rochelle in France, on the Atlantic coast of France. And they lived less than half a mile from each other. Indeed, they worked together, and it is certain that my family and the Jays knew each other and indeed worked together. It is possible that there may well have been intermarriage. There is compelling evidence to that effect, but not yet conclusive. And what is certain is that both families fled to England following the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, and there my families and the Jays found freedom, prosperity, and relative religious tolerance. Inspired by this personal connection and by deep personal admiration for John Jay, I am working on a new diplomatic biography which I hope will put Jay back where he belongs, in the true pantheon and in the first rank of America's founders. Now, I want to talk tonight about Jay as a diplomat, but before we do that, we need to meet John Jay, personally. So let's come back in time with me. Come back in time to December 1745. And let me explain why this remarkable man became such an astonishingly good diplomat. John Jay was born on the 12th of December 1745 in his family's elegant, pressed stone house at 66 Pearl Street, a stone's throw from Francis Tavern in what is now Lower Manhattan, what is now really the financial district of Lower Manhattan. Then, Jay's birthplace was at the heart of the most desirable residential neighborhood in New York, home actually to 70 of its wealthiest merchants. John Jay was born, it must be said, to wealth and to privilege. And indeed, his father, and he's an interesting background because Jay comes from both, if you will, business, if you will, from commercial wealth, and also from, if you will, more traditional landowning wealth. His father, Peter, had been a highly successful, and here comes the first use of this word, 
international, international businessmen with a remarkable trading empire, with business associates in South America, the Caribbean, Britain, the Netherlands, France. Peter was an established member of New York's mercantile elite, and indeed, as so was his father before him, John Jay's grandfather. They were part of a remarkable transatlantic family with relatives, very close relatives in England and in the Netherlands, with whom they maintained close relationships, regularly exchanging letters, books, and magazines. And so the first point we get to about Jay is his internationalism, his cosmopolitanism. As he grew up in this remarkably cosmopolitan household. And it was through this channel that the Jay family became immersed, really, in international affairs and also became, I think, fully cognizant of the English and Scottish Enlightenment. Jay's British relatives sent a steady stream of books, pamphlets, magazines, by sailing ship to New York, where they were then put on a smaller sailing boat and arrived in this beautiful little dock at the end of the Jay family's 400-acre estate down in Rye. In short, the Enlightenment and the world came to John Jay by sailing boat at the end of his very long garden. Nice way to be, isn't it? Now, on the other side, you've got the landed pedigree. And here you come to John Jay's aristocratic pedigree, because indeed he was, in that sense, to the manner born. His aristocratic pedigree comes from his mother, Mary, a Van Cortland, and on her mother's side, a Phillips of Phillips Manor. I mean, those of you, I know you're all very knowledgeable. It doesn't get more patrician than that. And John Jay was thus born and into a colonial elite that was in part, if you will, a business elite, in part, a great landed family. And his early education was shaped by his parents and his extended family. I think one could say of that family that they were devoted, they were devout, indeed profoundly devout, enlightened, and once again we come back to this word, internationalist. Peter and Mary Jay were exceptionally devoted to their fifth child, whom they called Johnny. They had had other children, one very, very bright son, James, later knighted by King George III for his efforts in raising money on behalf of King's College. But the Jays could not escape the omnipresent threat of death and disease. Even the most privileged could not escape death and disease. One of John's elder siblings had died in infancy. Very tragically, there's nothing worse than losing a child. Another older brother and a sister were blinded by smallpox. Yet another brother, Augustus, was, I think, what we would today recognize as mentally retarded. So to Peter and Mary Jay, Johnny was very, very special. A blessing, a wonderful gift from God. In March 1746, determined to escape the city's sanitary, really quite not terribly good in sanitary conditions, Peter Jay and the family moved to this lovely 400-acre estate in Rye. And that estate is being restored. And if you ever have a chance to, uh, to go down there, it's still magnificent. Not as, as beautifully finished as the one in Bedford, which was the home that John Jay retired to, but this was Jay's childhood home. It's quite, and it was a stunning spot to grow up. He could run down in a matter of a couple of minutes, run down to the end of these beautiful long gardens and to this gentle little silky water. Oh, lovely. And he had a little favorite spot, a stone, and I've sat on that stone, and it was there that he liked to read. What an amazing spot to grow up in. If the Jays were unusually cosmopolitan, they were also unusually devout. Jay learned to read from the Bible. He was brought up in a deeply religious family, and indeed, like many other Huguenots, they converted to the established Anglican Church, or indeed what is commonly called here in the United States the um, Episcopal Church. And this was actually not as unusual as it sounds, because there was always a sort of Calvinist wing of the Church of England, uh, and indeed, just as there was at the time, a Calvinist wing of the, uh, of the American um, Anglican Church. Jay's parents imbued him with strong Christian values, and he grew up to be that rather rare bird an evangelical Episcopalian. He was arguably, and I think one can be certain of this, he was the only genuinely devout Christian among the top tier of the Founding Fathers. The only genuinely devout Christian amongst the top tier of the Founding Fathers. Now, 
as part of his upbringing, as part of his loving but quite strict upbringing, Jay's parents did something that was very important, that gave him a skill that was vital to his ability to function as a diplomat. They brought him up in the 18th century gentleman's code of civility. Civility that was a shared quality amongst the, if you will, the civilized elites on both sides of the Atlantic, which emphasized self-discipline, control of one's passions, control of one's words and manners, integrity, and indeed, a commitment to the betterment of society, and above all, a profound sense of duty. That is John Jay. Now, the second part of his upbringing, which I find particularly fascinating, and I think really equipped him very well, not just as a constitutional thinker, but as a diplomat, was the way that John Jay stocked his mind. He had an insatiable knowledge, an insatiable desire for knowledge and learning. Jay began with, again, devoted parents. They taught him to read at a very, very early age. They ensured that he had private tutors who taught him Latin and Greek. But above all, he went, of course, to King's College, now called Columbia, and took on there a curriculum which was modeled, transplanted, really, from Oxford and from Cambridge. Later on, after he graduated and after he was apprenticed in the law, he participated in one of those classic sort of both French, British, Dutch, and indeed East Coast 13 colony club called I mean, a real kind of enlightenment society. It was called the Moot Court Club. He was a good lawyer. And they enjoyed arguing, debating issues of jurisprudence. Now, what I think is fascinating here is that his parents recognized that he had remarkable intellectual ability. They saw this at a very early age. And indeed, they ensured that Jay learned French, which he did. He was fluent in Latin and Greek, educated by a private uh, uh, tutor, George, George Murray, who introduced him to Latin. And Latin was vital because Latin brought him to the great Roman thinkers, particularly those Roman thinkers who wrote about honor and duty, and that deeply, in, that was deeply Im, embedded in Jay's mind. Now, when I talk about this or teach about this, either at West Point or at SUNY Ulster or, or elsewhere, one often has to remind people that, in fact, people went to college in those days at a very, very early age. Jay went to King's College at the age of 14. 14. And Jay was, in many respects, as a result of this education, in many respects, better prepared, certainly better educated, than the British statesmen that he dealt with. Yes, they all went to Oxford, to Oxford and Cambridge, but I'm afraid Oxford and Cambridge was, in those days, pretty much more of an elevated drinking club. I mean, most people didn't go to lectures, they didn't do their papers, they, you know, they had a jolly good time, and they graduated with what one might call a gentleman's third. In other words, they barely scraped by. And they were actually not very well educated. Those who were educated in the, if you will, the transplanted Oxford and Cambridge, at Harvard or at Yale or at the College of William and Mary or particularly King's College and, of course, at Princeton, ah, they had a real advantage because their education was much, much sharper and much deeper. Try this on for size. I often say to cadets at West Point or the Air Force Naval Academy or indeed to students at SUNY Ulster, say to them, right, you know, um, would you rather go to college in the 20th or the 21st centuries or would you rather go to college in the 18th century? Because there was a strong emphasis on Greek and Latin. By the way, you had to have them in order to get in in the first place. Pretty impressive. In addition, Jay, in his first two years, studied mathematics, um, history, science, by the way. Now, there were no science labs, obviously, but he studied the works of Sir Isaac Newton. All of them. All of them. Moral philosophy political philosophy. At age 16, they learned the modern enlightenment, which is really, if you will, the latest thing of the time. The works of Francis Hutcheson and the other, David Hume, the other thinkers of the Scottish enlightenment. John Locke, yes. 
and he also read Plutarch. Plutarch's Lives is probably the most single most important book in John Jay's life because his careful reading of Plutarch's Lives convinced him of the importance of having high moral standards in public life and profoundly shaped his own life and his own career of service. Even more impressive and actually extremely helpful for Jay as a diplomat was the subject of his thesis. Yeah, you had to write the equivalent of an American of a modern day master's thesis to graduate. It was Hugo Grotius who wrote his piece on Hugo Grotius's Law of War and Peace. Rather helpful if you're going to be a diplomat, isn't it, Paul? Rather useful, isn't it? Oh, and by the way, you'd like to graduate, right? Yeah? Well, you've got to defend your thesis, much as those of us who went on to graduate study or you know, all had to do, right? Defend your thesis with the entire faculty. You'd, like, you'd still like to graduate, right? Wouldn't you? Yeah? Okay. Fine. Well, you've then got to give a 10-minute summary at commencement. Now, my son William, who dro bro drove me here tonight because of, my, because of my broken arm, graduated just very recently from a very fine college um, in Massachusetts. So um, I'm not sure you would have liked to have gone up and up and given a 10-minute speech in front of everyone who was there at commencement. But I think the really important point here is that Jay's remarkable upbringing gave him civility, the qualities of gentlemen, a remarkably rigorous education, right? Because you had to study all that philosophy, not in English. No cliff notes, no Wikipedia, in the original Latin and Greek. Wow. Jay had a remarkable upbringing and a remarkable knowledge of political systems, of political history, of skills and knowledge. I think what today we call really rigorous critical thinking skills that were going to become absolutely vital. He also became an outstanding young lawyer, arguably probably one of the two best in New York City at the, at the time. And he shaped his intellect further by the small legal club, the moot court club, where they discussed jurisprudence, they argued points of law with each other. Wonderful. Just exactly what young lawyers should do, Paul, right? Exactly what they should do, and alas, what many of them don't do. All right, that's Jay. We brought him to the point of a distinguished young lawyer, but there are clouds upon the horizon, clouds of war upon the horizon. But I want to turn now to sort of set the table um, a little bit for the second half of this by talking to you a little bit about a profession which really absorbed virtually most of my professional career until about nine years ago, diplomacy. Because I think we need to set the table to understand how important these diplomats, these handful of American diplomats actually were. Diplomacy has always been, I think, primarily concerned with war and peace, promoting, protecting international trade, security, peace, war, alliances, treaties. Diplomats are part of what some observers have described as an antique and mysterious Freemasonry. Some have even suggested that we are the world's oldest profession. <laughs> By the late 18th century, unlike today, ambassadors were very, very powerful figures. They were custodians of highly sensitive information and they were given the power to make decisions on the basis of that information. Decisions ultimately really about war and peace. And this was how it had to be. There was no CNN, right? No internet, no telexes, no telegrams, nothing. Communications technology was non-existent. Detailed instructions from one's government took weeks or even months to get there, if they ever got there at all. They came by special courier, traveling by sailing ship, or by horse-drawn carriage. When I first became a diplomat, the highly classified diplomatic bag came with a courier with it really almost, with it tied to his arm, literally clicked onto his arm, and he came by jumbo jet. And even that, was, even that when I was retiring from the diplomatic service, even that had become rather, rather passe at that stage. But you can see the point. There was no communications technology at all. You waited, things came on paper, fine, but they took weeks, months, and sometimes they didn't turn up at all. 
So you had to be able to effectively protect your nation's interests by yourself, because by yourself was where you were. Ambassadors had no easy access to the analysis and the judgment of their foreign ministers, their whole departments. Yeah. If I wanted some analysis on some subject to do with arms control, I just you know, sent a quick message and I got it on a secure effects line. You know, easy. So against this background you know, of basically having to operate on your own, ambassadors and ministers had to be men of exceptional quality. They had to know the minds of their political masters, or in the case of John Jay, of his colleagues back in Philadelphia, and to enjoy their full confidence. They also had to understand their government's policies and, of course, the political and the economic circumstances that shaped them. In addition, 18th century ambassadors had to have a clear understanding of where their country's vital interests lay and what steps were necessary to protect them. Moreover, 18th century ambassadors also had to have a deep understanding of the intentions and the policies, of course, of the government to which they were accredited, coupled with sound working relationships with the statesmen that led them and the political culture in which they were all embedded. Fine, but one thing you have to be very careful about doing, it's a cardinal sin in diplomacy. It's called going native. In other words, beginning to identify more with the government to which you are accredited than the government you're representing. And this was particularly a real danger, and I'll suggest a little in just a few minutes, that I think Benjamin Franklin fell prey to that a little bit. So to do all this, you had to be pretty bloody remarkable, didn't you? An 18th century ambassador had to be a natural leader. He also had to have an exceptional, agile mind a sound grasp of international law, a level of self-confidence, self-discipline, and strength of character to deal with challenging circumstances. Hmm, sounds like a good fit for John Jay, eh? Above all, an 18th century ambassador had to be capable of doing two crucial things. The first was to negotiate on his own. There was not going to be any, you know, any, um, any flying squad arriving in by jet from London or Washington or Paris. Uh-uh, it was not going to happen. You were on your own. You had to negotiate on your own using your own initiative and your own good judgment, hopefully to good effect. The second thing was to support your government's policy effectively, clarify it, and frankly, if your instructions didn't make any bloody sense, then do what you thought was right and damn the consequences. Now, against that background, Having set that bit of the table, let's look a little bit more closely at the challenges facing an American diplomat in the 1780s and the 1790s. They were really severe because the infant American Republic was small. It was deeply indebted to France and the Netherlands. It was economically and politically weak, incapable of backing its diplomacy with a credible threat of force on the international arena. And as if this were not enough, all this was not bad enough, the Revolutionary War had left the whole 13 colonies in financial chaos. They had indeed suffered almost Weimar Germany levels of inflation because some states indeed had printed unsecured paper money with reckless abandon. And as if all this were not bad enough, France and Spain posed a threat. Yeah, Americans tend not to think about this. France and Spain posed a threat to the territorial integrity of the United States. And relations with Britain, of course, were still, understandably, recovering from the physical and the psychological wounds of the Revolutionary War. So, if you are John Jay, or you're John Adams, or you're Thomas Jefferson, or you're Benjamin Franklin, or indeed, somewhat just slightly later on, John Quincy Adams, you're playing, <laughs> you're playing international diplomacy with a very, very, very small and weak deck of cards, aren't you? You're playing a very weak hand. But Jay, was outstanding. He was actually ideally suited to be an 18th century American ambassador. He had all the qualities necessary to play this weak hand, this very, very weak hand, skillfully in a dangerous international environment. The tall conservative Huguenot had one of the most brilliant and productive minds of 18th century America, as we have focused on. His education at King's College, often called Oxford on the Hudson, where he'd been educated in Greek, Latin, philosophy, public law, natural science, and international law, was crucial. As he demonstrated 
during his first about eight years or so as a young lawyer in New York, Jay, and of course Paul will recognize these as the qualities of a great lawyer, was indeed exceptionally able, calm, judicious, patient, precise, resolute, subtle, and with an almost inexhaustible capacity for hard work. Above all, Jay was a realist, a pragmatic realist, with those qualities found only amongst the very greatest of diplomats. An understanding of the importance of secrecy and timing, coupled with the courage to uh, tear up unrealistic instructions from home, which indeed, by the way, which is exactly what John Jay did during the critical negotiations to end the Revolutionary War. He was a New York patrician who had married the daughter of William Livingston, the powerful New Jersey Whig. So John Jay was secure in himself, secure in his place in New York society. He was a man who honestly, I don't think, had a, had a day of self-doubt in his life. He was a man of great self-confidence, so important for an American, not just in New York society, later in the Continental Congress, but now in the world of international diplomacy. When you met him, he was a man of gravitas. He was also a man with a great capacity for building and maintaining lasting friendships. A man of unquestioned and unquestionable integrity, sound judgment, great wisdom. Above all, now and then, everyone agreed that John Jay was the most ethical of America's founding fathers. He was a man you could really trust. And Jay, in fact, had a number of really important qualifications that really were ideal for the role, the critical role he was going to play in Paris in the summer of 1782. When Benjamin Franklin was very ill, he had both gallstones and kidney stones. Lord, God, the poor man must have been in awful pain. But Jay arrived on instructions from the Congress to really, in essence, to take over the negotiations. A good job that he did. Jay had a good feeling, a good understanding of European real politic. He'd spent two years, frustratingly, at the Spanish court, France's junior partner in the Bourbon Pact, and he'd drawn some important lessons. He knew the realities of Europe. He knew that Congress's instructions about getting a treaty of alliance with Spain was totally unrealistic, and indeed that Spain had no interest in America's rebellion succeeding at all. Spanish King and his government were nervous about the effect that a successful North American rebellion against Britain would have upon its unhappy and rebellious Central and South American colonies. The Spanish government were also afraid of the presence of American settlers west of the Appalachian Mountains because they had the potential to threaten Spanish sovereignty over those parts of the continental United States, part west of the Mississippi, and of course over Florida. And they hadn't even thought about Disneyland at that stage. So Che had learned that, you know, for the Europeans, for the Spanish and indeed for the French diplomats he met coming down from Paris, he learned that, you know, the American War of Independence, the American Revolution was, I'm afraid, don't, please don't be offended, was merely a sideshow, important to the Spaniards and to the French for one reason and one reason only, because it weakened their arch enemy, Britain. The second lesson I think he learned was that France and Spain were colluding together to keep America as a small client state, prevented from expanding any further west than the Appalachians or any further south than Georgia. Jay, in other words, was a cold-eyed realist who knew exactly what the French and Spaniards were up to. He had a sound grasp of European real politique. I think the other point is that Jay understood the importance of national interest. I personally find the way American academics teach international relations to be hilariously funny. The textbooks are full of rubbish like games theory, game theory and all this sort of stuff. And, you know, they actually believe that in, in international relations theory can actually predict, you can find laws that govern how states move around in the world. Having served as a diplomat for 20 years, it's absolute poppycock. It's nonsense. States act according to their national interest. End of story. Full stop. Period. That's it. And Jay was convinced, and he understood this, he was convinced that no country would act against what it perceived to be its national interest. And to expect any country to do so would be absolute utter folly. So he saw 
that the United States was going to have to operate according to its national interests and should not be guided by the French as his instructions coming from the Congress in Philadelphia, a Congress, by the way, manipulated, corrupted and manipulated by the French. Oh, no, Jay had a very tough realpolitik grasp of these things, indeed. He knew from his experience, he knew from his experience as a diplomat in Europe, as indeed from his experience at the Continental Congress, that really, it was very wise to be, to be, to be very suspicious of French intentions. It certainly was. Now, Jay never forgot France's repeated attempts to interfere in American internal affairs. He grasped that the Spaniards and the French wanted to keep America small and weak. Well, as far as he was concerned, we were having none of that, thank you very much. We were having none of that. We were going to build a strong America. That was his view. Jay also had a great sense of timing. He knew and he understood British politics. He understood that with the collapse of Lord North's government following the defeat, of course, at Yorktown, that the new Whig government of the Marquis of Rockingham and the Rockingham Whigs sounds like a 1960s pop group in Britain um, of considerably lesser stature, of course, than the Beatles or, or uh, the Rolling Stones. But there you go. But the Marquis of Rockingham and Lord Shelburne were and had been Ameri Britain's, had really been America's friends in Britain. They'd been willing to recognize American independence before serious talks began. They had, in fact, actually opposed the war. They'd opposed Lord North and opposed the war and favored reconciliation because they saw that in doing so, America would be freed from the shackles imposed by the Franco-American alliance and indeed that cunning and rather devious French foreign minister, Count Vergin, for whom Benjamin Franklin was, I'm afraid, a somewhat all too pliable ally. And Jay also saw, unlike, by the way, John Adams, although I yield to no one in, in my admiration for Adams as well, is that Jay saw Britain as America's natural partner, bound by the common law, bound by ties of blood, kinship, culture, and commerce, but also joined by something else, and that's all which was to be the foundation of the special relationship much, much later, that we had a clear, common, strategic interest in ensuring that no one major hostile power dominated Europe. Hamilton saw that. George Washington saw that. Jay saw that. Jefferson never, I think, really grasped that. Jay's an extraordinary, Jefferson, an extraordinary man, by the way, but not as a diplomat and not as a strategic thinker. Anyway, Jay, of course, deployed the arrogance of George III and the stupidity of Lord North's government, but he understood that a long-term strategic and closer relationship with Britain was vital to America's prosperity and to its security. And so, if you will, getting in quickly, getting a deal quickly with the British in the summer of 1782 was vital because restoring close relations with Britain would not only enable the American colonies to become truly independent of France, but would also link American and British security policy, harnessing the Royal Navy to protect American territorial integrity against potential aggression from what he saw as America's real enemy, France and Spain. Jay also, of course, had been a first-class lawyer, and in law, as in diplomacy, process and procedure matters. They really matter. Why? Because they drive outcomes. When you are playing a weak hand, they matter even more. And so Jay's insistence that Britain recognize American independence as a precondition for further substantive talks was of vital importance because it not only satisfied American honor, it clarified the basis on which the formal negotiations could take place. Let's get independence out of the way quickly. Look, it is a de facto reality already. Let's just accept it and let's get on with the other, let's get on with the other um, business, which I think is exactly what he did. The preliminary Anglo-American Treaty of the 30th of November, 1782, signed on a very snowy day in Paris and later incorporated into the final Treaty of Paris in 1783 was an absolute triumph for the American team of John Adams, John Jay, and Benjamin Franklin. Because it not only reaffirmed Britain's earlier recognition of American independence, 
But interestingly, it confirmed American sovereignty over a huge territory west of the Appalachians and the Mississippi. The treaty also denied the Loyalists any compensation for confiscated property. It gave the Americans fishing rights off the Great Banks of Newfoundland. But what American scholars, I think, sometimes ignore is that, like any good treaty, it looked after each side's best interests. For Britain, it not only detached America from France and thwarted France and Spain's territorial ambitions on the American continent, it eased Britain's financial burdens, indeed, helped restore Anglo-American trade and investment relations. But for Britain, and people south of this border tend to forget this, it also established a second state on the North American continent. I think you know what it was. Canada. Canada was firmly established north of the border, a British state north of the border. And indeed, last time I checked, it is still Her Majesty's Dominion, I'm pleased to say. So, you know, yes, the Americans were big winners. Of course they were. So were the British. Because what Britain wanted was trade, business, investment relations back to normal, Canada firmly, firmly established, and basically getting back to what had been the great phrase of the earlier part of the 18th century, the empire of enterprise and freedom. Let's get back, in other words, to working together and making a lot of money together, which we did. The only real loser in all this was France. Although all the American envoys made important contributions to this remarkable diplomatic success, John Adams believed that John Jay had played the most important role. I agree. I agree. He got the timing right. He got in quickly because he knew that this war, because remember, the Revolutionary War here became after Saratoga, after France comes in, France then declares war on Britain, it becomes another world war, right? Of which the American Revolutionary War is only one, frankly, small theater. And ironically enough, incidentally, Britain loses the Revolutionary War in the, this small theater, but it wins everywhere else. There you go. There you go. There you go. But he understood that, that pretty soon, the European governments were going to be broke. Basically, they just couldn't afford these wars anymore. There was going to have to be peace talks. And so the important thing was to nip in ahead of the rest and get a really good deal with a sympathetic and now sympathetic British government consisting of, Britain's friend, of America's friends in Britain. In addition, Jay also was very, very shrewd and very tough in pointing out that we needed to get a deal, the US and Britain needed to get a deal, make a separate peace without the French. And in this regard, I think we get into the, briefly into this very brief discussion about Benjamin Franklin. Because what Jay achieved was remarkable. Remember, Jay wrote this treaty out of his head, right? He wrote the first and second drafts of this treaty that end in actually the most important treaty in American diplomatic history because it's the first one. It's the one that establishes America as an independent state, as an independent member of the international community, right? And of course it ends the Revolutionary War. Jay wrote this out of his head, right? Today, we, in, in modern diplomatic negotiations, you've got teams of lawyers and you know, so many people involved, it becomes, a, it becomes a nightmare, right? So much simpler back then, but particularly when you're somebody as brilliant as Jay, who literally wrote this treaty, literally, lock, stock, and barrel, out of his head. It went back to the British Foreign Office, who had their people go at it, tweak it, and so forth, and then came back to him, he rewrote it again, all out of his head, completely out of his own head, remarkable. But he was also most insistent that America act on its own without French, quote unquote, guidance. I mentioned to you earlier that Jay had had a remarkable, um, a truly remarkable education and that he'd studied the works of Sir Isaac Newton. And there's a lovely quote that John Jay wrote to his thinking of his old law partner, Robert Livingston, who in fact was also here at the writing of the Constitution. Jay wrote, and this is, you can see the influence of Sir Isaac Newton and scientific revolution on Jay's own thinking. He says, and I quote, let us be honest and grateful 
for France? But let us think for ourselves. Since we have assumed a place in the political firmament, let us move like a primary, not a secondary planet. Very Newtonian. You can hear, here's that young student of Sir Isaac Newton coming through again. Yes, let's be grateful to France. Sure, I mean, without French money, et cetera, et cetera. You all, you all know that. But remember, the French had very different strategic objectives. Jay saw through them very, very easily. And it was an extraordinary accomplishment. Now, let me just say for one second that I do not mean to diminish the achievement of Benjamin Franklin for one moment. Franklin turned in an astonishing solo performance. Six to seven years, he was America in France. He pulled off a, what today would be called a brilliant feat of public diplomacy, not just by turning up and smiling graciously or sometimes seductively at the ladies in the Paris salons, right? but also he cultivated, he had receptions, events, he really practiced diplomacy in, in a new way. And you've got to give Franklin enormous credit because he built up such a groundswell of fantastic goodwill towards America. And that, need, that was there, and it was much needed. Because after they'd signed a separate peace with, um, with London, uh, Franklin said, well, this is all very well, but I'm afraid I now have to go and see the French Foreign Ministry because we need another loan. <laughs> <laughs> Lastly, I want to touch. Jay comes home. He becomes Chief Justice of the, of the US Supreme Court, uh, appointed by President Washington, confirmed, of course, by the Senate. And Jay then, in 1794, is in a remarkable, by the, by the way, violation of the separation of powers, is sent by President Washington to London. Chief Justice of the United States is sent to London. He's sent there for a damn good reason, because he knows how to negotiate with Britain better than anybody else does. And he understands British diplomacy, British foreign policy, British politics better than anybody else does. And he negotiates there a treaty called Jay's Treaty. It's had a pretty lousy press from many American historians who argue that Jay just caved in, and if he'd only pressed harder, Britain would have made lots of concessions. Frankly, British scholars think this is, this is a load of rot, and so, and so do I. Because to me, critics of Jay's Treaty, then and now, combine the ability to find the doubtful points of a diplomatic deal with an inability to judge whether the deal as a whole was better than any alternative. And it was. The critics misunderstand Jay's approach because Jay saw this as a further step in reconciliation with Britain by removing as much as possible sources of irritation and friction in that relationship. Principal amongst them being giving American business access to the Caribbean, which it, which it traditionally had, had had when it was part of the British Empire, neutrality rights, and um, really opening up as much Anglo-American business to what we today would call free trade. His astute analysis of British politics and policy told him that there was a government in London, and there was, that wanted to heal the wounds of the Revolutionary War and really build a constructive relationship with an independent America. King George III, had, even George III had said that to John Adams. Jay thought the time was right to cut a deal. And the young British Foreign Secretary, Lord Granville, who was almost the exact same age as Jay, because Jay was now only about 42, shared Jay's hopes that if he was, if he was, he would work together with Jay. They had common geopolitical instincts. They wanted to get an agreement so that Britain could continue fighting the revolutionary French and soon to be Napoleon. And Jay's treaty, I think, was immensely important. To be sure, it made a virtue of necessity. It prevented war when the United States could not afford it. And indeed, George Washington, very prudently, I see his great portrait here, George Washington, the, arguably, in my judgment, probably the greatest statesman of the, late eight, of the late 18th century. But Washington was pursuing a policy of strength through peace. It was the right thing to do. It marked the birth of a common Anglo-American strategic outlook, the hesitant beginnings of a new mutual understanding. It linked American and British security policy because it recognized that the Royal Navy was in fact America's first line of defense against France and Spain. And of course, 
It also nudged Anglo-American commercial relations forward towards free trade and limited the most dangerous of the frictions. It was a remarkable diplomatic feat. I'm a practitioner, former practitioner of diplomacy, and I know what real diplomacy is. This was real diplomacy at work. It was the best deal that could be done, and it was a good one. As you know, Jay was burned in effigy. There were bonfires up and down the 13 states, you know, damn John Jay, burning him in effigy, and so forth. And you know, Jay might have been president. Jay might have actually succeeded George Washington or John Adams had he not done this, but he knew. He knew he was sacrificing any higher ambition. But to him, higher political ambition was secondary. Unlike so many politicians today, his goal was put the country's interests first. And if that meant you didn't get to be president, so what? It was more important to have peace with Britain and to avoid another war. And may I say that statesmen who help negotiate treaties that prevent unnecessary wars are to be applauded, not burned in effigy. Let me conclude because I've spoken for far too long and I hope, and I certainly do not wish to uh, emulate the long-winded British politician of whom Winston Churchill commented, and I quote, that he has exhausted time and encroached upon eternity. <laughs> so I merely want to thank you for the great privilege of speaking in this distinguished series. It's been an absolutely, I'm on, fortunate, fortunately I'm on uh, Paul's list. And what an extraordinary group of people that you, ha that you have here. Standards have clearly been lowered tonight, but there you are. Uh, there's always a downer here, here and there. But thank you for the great privilege of speaking to you. Thank you for the great work, Paul, that you are doing. It's just really remarkable what you are doing. Thank you, too, to the site for the great work. And I'm so delighted that the state's putting some money behind it because this is the birthplace of American constitutionalism. And it's been a privilege to be here with you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Ray, thank you so much. That was, that was absolutely amazing. And, and why couldn't I have had a professor in college like Professor Raymond? You know how much money I would have saved that was spent at the local taverns? I would have actually gone to class. So, uh, and as I said right in the beginning, the enthusiasm Ray has, it, it, it really is. Uh, it, it's contagious, and it really, it just, it, 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 he exudes the love of history and does more for our local history than, than, than almost anybody. So Ray, we thank you so much. And it, it was great to get a different take on the, the diplomacy, to look at it from a different angle. We think of, here's France, they are our, you know, they're our bosom buddies. And at the end, they really weren't. They were always going, they, their interest was always at heart. And, and to see it from somebody who spent a career in the diplomatic corps, uh, to understand that, yes, some people like John Jay, who understood that, we sometimes think, how could they have made a peace separate from France after everything that they've been through? Well, you know what? If it was in France's interest, they would have done the same thing. Exactly so uh, thank you very oh, much. Way, that's what, that's what Virgin said to Franklin when Franklin came in rather shamefacedly saying, well, <clears throat> I'm terribly sorry, but you know, about negotiating that separate peace with Britain, and uh, can we have a loan, please? And Virgin said, look, yeah, yeah. We would have done the same thing. <laughs> you know, it is, and I hadn't thought of it that way, and I feel much better about what we did in the Treaty of, of Paris. Uh, do we have any questions for Professor Raymond? Or comments or insults are fine as well. <laughs> How about questions? No questions? Oh, yes, sir. Oh, oh. sorry, Mom. Um, what was, uh, how long did he live, and where did he finally terminate his life. Jay uh, returned, became governor of New York, and then uh, retired in 1800. Uh, his plan was to retire to Bedford, which indeed he did, with his wonderful wife, uh, Sarah, who, was, who we always call Sally, who he loved deeply, and tragedy struck. She died within a matter of about nine months of their moving to Bedford, which was very, very, very tragic indeed. Um, she was a remarkable woman, incidentally. Um, she um, really, I think, uh, established a kind of model for the US Foreign Service spouse in a way. She was remarkably knowledgeable, a wonderful, and she, you know, Jay, Jay's reputation for being a bit stiff, to which my response is that anybody 
who was regarded as the best dancer in New York and won the heart of the most beautiful young woman in New York, can't have been all that stiff, and all, all that stiff and formal. Um, but I think he needed to warm up to people, and she warmed people up. She was a tremendous host in that sense, in the, in the very best of that sense, best sense of the term. She had an excellent mind. Um, you know, she would have been a tremendous member of the Continental Congress herself. You know, not just everybody thinks of Abigail Adams, and absolutely right too, but there we go. But sadly, she died. Um, and, you know, even wealth and position did not protect you from the diseases of the time, sadly. And uh, so Jay lived on um, a widower. Um, he took uh, great solace in good works. He was always a great, a great he was a tremendous Christian. Um, he was one of the founders of the American anti-slavery movement, first called the Manumission Society, and he was one of its founders and funders. Um, but otherwise, he lived quietly on his farm in uh, retirement. He died in 18, the last of the founding generation was just looking over there to James, was James Madison, uh, 1829. Jay was about 1827. And um, he lived a remarkably long life, because remember in those days people lived until their, about their 50s, but he lived a remarkably long life and a healthy life. But what a contribution he made, an extraordinary contribution he made. May I just add one little point? He deliberately kept out of politics, totally out of politics, except on one occasion when he just could not resist. And that was in 1812, when his co-author of the Federalist Papers, the Federalist, um, James Madison, had declared, you know, had urged Congress to declare war on Britain. He and Governor Morris wrote an open letter, which I have found, an open letter calling for the impeachment of James Madison. Wow. The impeachment of James Madison by his fellow author of the Federalist and indeed by Governor Morris, the man who wrote the final version of the US Constitution. That tells you how badly Madison had blundered. Anyway, there we go. So I think you were very kindly and very, very patiently waiting there. From the little bit I've read about Jay and John Adams, it seems that they were almost simpatico from the beginning. They were. And I'm wondering how much that relationship played into the Treaty of Paris and other things that they did It helped together. a great deal, because both of them were hard-headed realists. Um, both of them had had tough diplomatic experiences. Uh, Jay in Spain. Although, in fact, I found some evidence that, in fact, he did get some money out of Spain, a small amount of money out of Spain. They both had really tough experiences. J um, Ad John Adams had a very difficult time at first in the Netherlands uh, in persuading the Dutch, the very, you know, hard-nosed Dutch, Dutch bankers, uh, who were the, you know, along with the bankers of London, were the most important international bankers of the day, trying to persuade them to take America seriously, you know? And I think they both had that common experience that shared experience in common of really having to work at it, you know? Because for Franklin, I mean, wonderful, extraordinary man though he, though he was, it was all delivered on a plate. Because Franklin was so well known in Paris, he was a star figure. I mean, uh, you know, he, was a, he was like a sort of Stephen Hawking, if you will. I and mean, he, you know, he was one of those intellectual celebrities in the best sense of that term. He'd received the gold medal of the, the, of the, uh, the, gold medal of the uh, Royal Society in London, which, had, of course, made him a, an intellectual celebrity in France. And all of the uh, French uh, Enlightenment thinkers saw him as one of our own. The Americans are sending one of our own. It's wonderful. You know? So he just had red carpet thrown out for him. He really didn't, didn't have to work at it all that hard in that sense, in terms of building relationships, because there were so many people. He says, oh, the great Dr. Franklin, welcome to France, you know, and so forth. Um, whereas Adams and Jay really had to slog at it. I mean, Adams worked for two years. He did yeoman's work. I mean, really incredibly skillful, sophisticated diplomacy in terms of winning the Dutch over and then getting a two million, I mean, in, in today's, days, today's dollars, God knows, $2 million loan out of them. And those are hard-nosed Dutch, Dutch bankers. They were not easy to persuade, like Wall Street bankers today, uh, not easy to persuade on a deal. So I think there was that. Oh, there were also, I think, lawyers. Both of them were very distinguished lawyers. Um, Adams, of course, had really been a very, very distinguished lawyer in Boston. Paul, again, great, a great lawyer. And a man, I think, also very much like Jay of principle and courage. I mean, remember, John Adams was the man who defended the British soldiers after the so-called massacre um, in Boston. It wasn't a massacre, you know. It was a real classic um, staged with Sam Adams in the back choreographing it all. This was, this was, this was a setup, actually. 
But um, nonetheless, that's what we now know the history of it. But Adams, John Adams was amazing. He said, I will take their case. He said, no man should be without counsel. Both of them, I think, were shared passionate belief in the law and the rule of law. They both had a passionate belief in, uh, they were both American nationalists, American interests. And I mean, just on a humorous note, in the final days of the uh, negotiations, um, John Adams was hammering away relentlessly on the subject of fishing, which is absolutely vital to the economy of New England and to get access to those um, wonderful fishing assets off the, uh, off the uh, coast of Newfoundland. Uh, which, of course, had, they had had access to as part of the British Empire, and um, to which point one of the senior British negotiators said, Mr. Adams, of course you'll have the fish, for God's sake. Can we talk about anything but fish? And can we please have anything for lunch except fish? <laughs> <laughs> You've got it. Fine. No problem. Done. But let's have no more talk of fish. Let's, let, let's not eat any fish, but let's end it. But they were both American nationalists. They were both committed to getting the job done in a very pragmatic way. They both, I think, had had, well, I think Jay had had no negative, well, yes, sorry. Jay's experience with the French obviously was negative. Um, like my own family, you know, there were persecutions, French Protestants were persecuted, and after all, you couldn't expect a French Huguenot, only, what, three or four generations removed, few generations removed, to look favorably on France. That a country that had uh, a country that had uh, you know done its best to kill his forebears, and mine too for that matter, um, and um, he'd also seen at first hand, as had Adams, the the really sort of diplomacy is one thing, but interfering in another country's internal affairs is wrong. You know, there's no if you're asked to go and speak to the Senate, the House, whatever it is, that's fine. I mean, I've done it. It's fine. That's fine. But you don't go manipulating a country's in internal affairs. And both Adams and Jay had both seen it. So they both had the measure of the French. They were both lawyers. And I think they both had a really tough early diplomatic experience of really having to work for it. Two tough years in Spain, two tough years in the Netherlands. You really get a feel for what the tough realities of diplomacy are like. You know, uh, when you've just got to get up and go at it the next day and keep trying to persuade people, you know, and keep trying to persuade the Dutch that we needed, you know, $2 million was needed, keep trying to persuade uh, the Spanish, you know, tough, tough, tough job. Sir? Uh, given Jay's diplomatic uh, background, why would, why would Washington recommend him to the Supreme Court rather than Secretary of State? Good question. He was a very distinguished lawyer. and. Um, he was a very, very distinguished lawyer, and although the founders had clearly not thought through, nor had they spent a great deal of time in the final phase of the in the final phase of the um, conference, the 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 great conference, the great conference in the summer and early so fall of 1787 on the role of the Supreme Court. Nevertheless, um, Jay was he really persuaded Jay to take it. He really prevailed upon Jay to take it because Jay was not terribly keen on taking it. The reason being that, unlike the Supreme Court now, which meets in a very nice building and the case has come to you up through a very structured, very sophisticated system uh, of federal courts, um, in fact, the Supreme Court in those days had to get on their horses <laughs> and ride circuit, uh, ride circuit in um, effect. And Jay said, "Oh." God, you know, the last bloody thing I want to do is start riding circuit, you know. Uh, but that's what he had to do. So Jay jumped at um, a diplomatic assignment. And of course, President Washington, great statesman that he was, had to accommodate different. He had to, um, I know that uh, this has been said of Abraham Lincoln, but it should also be said of George, of George, George Washington. He also had to have a cabinet of rivals as well. He had to find a role for Jefferson whose views were very different than Jay's. I mean, he had, to, he had to make room for, if you will, what were to become the Federalists and Anti-Federalists, all in the one cabinet. So, I mean, if anybody had established a model for a cabinet of rivals, it was Washington established that model. And, of course, actually, I'm just reading, in case you haven't seen it, it's a wonderful book out uh, called uh, Lincoln, Lincoln, Son of the Founders. Amazing man. And Lincoln studied them very well. I'm not surprised that Lincoln had a cabinet of rivals as well. Washington did. So he had to find a role for others. And Jay, um, Jay really, I think, he loved the law, was hoping it wasn't going to be writing the circuit. But, you know, when George Washington asked you to do something, you didn't say no. You didn't say no. Yeah. When did your book come 
Oh, quite some time to come. I mean, there is a lot of research to be done in France. There's a lot of research to be done in Britain, and that's very, very expensive. So it'll be some, it'll be some time. I mean, what I am trying to do is to get the, is to get the early chapters um, together. Um, one of the other frustrating things as well is, and just to mention uh, as, as an aside on this, is that sadly, although Jay, John Jay's son was excellent in terms of keeping his father's papers carefully, his grandson was absolutely profligate. <laughs> he just, they, were, they got scattered to the four winds, even, for example, in 1857, uh, when the Prince of Wales, uh, the future King Edward VII, was visiting um, the United States. Um, the, there, were royal visits, there were royal visits even then, um, and uh, Jay gave him a present of a whole pile of his father's papers. They are now held in Windsor Castle. <laughs> <laughs> However, Her Majesty the Queen, being the wonderful and lovely lady that, that, that she is, uh, got them all put on microfilm. You, you, you might remember that old technology that used to be out, out there, and so they're in the Columbia, uh, Columbia's archives, but they're quite difficult to get at, and it's quite difficult to use. In fact, it's probably easier to use the um, originals, but that means a trip to Britain. But but there you go. But no, I mean, basically it needs, I mean, what I really want to bring to it is that multi-archival perspective, which is all too often missing um, from studies of this, because it does give you a global view, I think. So several years, I'm afraid. Do we have any other questions? Or comments or insults? Or? Thank you very much. Professor, could I ask about the, the, uh, his drive to become governor of New York State, mm -hmm. uh, having been the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court? The, what was the driving force? Uh, you know, to be very honest with you, I wish I could answer your question with the thoughtfulness and knowledge that your question requires. That's something I've not focused on yet. I've been focusing so heavily on Jay's early life and on his diplomacy. Uh, I've not got to that yet. One, I know one of the big difficulties is that all of Jay's papers relating to his governorship, the race for governor and so forth, were all in the New York State archives and sadly got burnt. They were sadly destroyed in a fire at the, around the turn of the 20th century. It was very, very, very sad, unfortunately. Very, 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 very sad indeed. So we'll, you know, that, that, phase of his, that phase of his life and career, it's a great question. It deserves a thoughtful, thorough, and knowledgeable answer, and I'm not yet in a position to do so. But I will be, within about a year or two. I will be. <laughs> You know, John Jay actually showed what kind of uh, person he was in, he became the second governor of New York after uh, George Clinton, but he lost the election prior to the election that he won. Uh, George Clinton didn't run for that election. And the reason he didn't win is because John Jay actually won that, that election before. What had happened was there was a, a claimed discrepancy in the votes of one of the counties in western New York, what they did is they threw out all of the votes. Had those votes been counted, John Jay wins, he's governor of New York. They're out, George Clinton uh, wins, and that leads to the greatest battle in Kingston's history. More so than the burning of Kingston, it was the battle at the corner of Maiden Lane and Fair Street between the Jayites who uh, frequented the Elmendorf Tavern. It wasn't known as the Elmendorf Tavern at the time. It was known as the Indian Queen. Uh, the Clintonites would hang out at the Elmendorf, what we call the Elmendorf Tavern, which is still there today. It was actually known as the Dark Horse then. When the results of that election came out, they met in the middle of the intersection. They apparently had a battle that went for hours. Uh, and it was known, it was legendary for years. So John Jay uh, is in, is indirectly responsible for this greatest battle, but what he did do is he acceded the election to George Clinton. He could have made a huge stink about it, he didn't, so he was, he was really, I think, always known as a gentleman. Oh, indeed. Uh, I must share with you a very funny note to end with. Um, was it not ever thus in American politics? Um, one of my jobs as a diplomat was explaining to the, um, to the prime minister what was going on in um, American politics. By the way, can you imagine what explaining Florida in 2000 was like? Um, a colleague of mine and I came up with a little note. It was called Florida Made Simple. We were on Florida Made Simple number 23 when things got, but I remember getting a call from Jonathan Powell from the prime minister's chief of staff saying, Ray, the prime minister wants to know, um, what what happens here? You know, how do we? How does the United States get out of this? You know, sorry. What happens? How is the election actually going to do? Going to get sorted? But the funny story I wanted to share with you was, what they needed back in those days was television. 
was television. Um, in 1968, um, the election, of course, between um, the election between Richard Dixon and Hubert Humphrey, uh, and the then uh, mayor of um, the then mayor of Chicago, Mayor Daley. I love American politics. Great stuff. Great stuff. Mayor Daley was holding, as usual, was holding back the Chicago votes because he needed to know how many, how many he was going to say he had to ensure that his candidate won won Illinois. And what made a difference was that, um, in fact, an old friend of mine now, one of President Nixon's advisors, went to the CBS anchor who was Wallace, Chris Wallace's dad, who was on the air, and said, listen, make him release the numbers. Put him under pressure on the air. Put him under pressure on the air. He did. <clears throat> and the mayor of Chicago had to come up with a number. <clears throat> because, you know, Mayor, Mayor, Mayor Daley's view always was that, you know, if you were dead and you were buried in the uh, graveyards within the boundaries of Chicago, you had a full right to continue to participate in the uh, activities of the Democratic Party. <clears throat> so we had to make up a number out of his head. He did, and it was too low. And Nixon carried, no, Nixon carried um, uh, the state. But that was a trick that, that meant that, that Daly did every, to every time round. But it was the first time that anybody had used television effectively um, against him. But somehow, having to, got to know Jay very well, I don't think he would have done it. But none that he was too much of a gentleman. Anyway, there we go. Do we have any other questions? Do you, do you have one? Oh, no. Oh. Just, uh, you know, thank you. Oh. Thank you very much indeed. Ray? Thank you, sir. Right. Again, thank you so much. That that was uh, that was that was very very interesting and a very unique perspective on this. Uh, so uh, again, uh, uh, I want to let everybody know what our upcoming events. I also want to put up again. We always put up uh, the the thank you slide uh, to really show our appreciation for all the people who make this possible, particularly our speakers uh, and, and uh, everybody who publicizes the, this event. Um, and again, all of you. You make this this worth doing. Uh, Ray came out here tonight on a blustery night because he, he appreciates your love of history. So we thank you. Uh, and I do want to let everybody know our our upcoming events. Next month, February 20th, we have as our subject General Sherman Hasbrook. And we learned a little bit about him during the talk about Kingston High School. Uh, the title is Kingston and the Manhattan Project. And Sherman Hasbrook was from the first graduating class of Kingston High School. He was a West Point graduate. He ultimately became a general, was part of the Manhattan Project, and subsequently headed up the Atomic Commission after. We are going to have as our presenter, uh, uh, Sherman, Cur uh, Lieutenant Colonel Sherman Fleek, who is the historian at West Point, he is going to be—he's going to be joining us on February 20th, and on March 20th, our own Hugh Reynolds will be talking about Arthur Wicks, the cleaner who controlled the Senate. Uh, and it is because of Arthur Wicks, if I am, if I'm not incorrect, and Hugh, you can correct me, that we have that we have the throughway on this side of the Hudson River. So Hugh is going to tell us about him, and he's also going to tell us about the dry cleaning store that he had in Kingston. So again, Ray, we, Ray, we thank you so much. Uh, wonderful talk. And again, everybody, have a wonderful weekend. We'll see you next month.